Most, if not all, of the dynamic systems you'll encounter will have some amount of time delay inherent to it. And if you're building a controller for that system, it's going to have to account for that delay in some way. The delay might be so short that you can pretty much ignore it, or it might be long enough that it starts to degrade performance, and even make the system unstable. So in this video we're going to cover time delays, where they come from, and why they matter. I'm Brian, and welcome to a MATLAB Tech Talk. To begin, I want to quickly discuss some nomenclature, because I'm going to be talking about two main types of delay, distorting and non-distorting delays, and I want to make sure that we all have the same understanding as we go through this video. Let's start with distorting delays. Signals are distorted when the original shape is altered in some way. In the case of delay, this happens when the time delay is different for various frequencies that make up the signal. For example, let's say that a signal is made up of two distinct frequencies. A rather low frequency at one radians per second that gets delayed by half a second when it passes through some process, and a second higher frequency signal at three radians per second that is delayed by a second and a half when it passes through the process. Neither of these signal components are distorted, they're just delayed by different amounts. However, when the combined signal passes through that process, it will have a different shape it's been distorted. And rather than thinking about these delays in the time domain, since each frequency is delayed differently, it's helpful to think about them in the frequency domain. How much each frequency is delayed through a process is what we're looking at at the phase portion of a Bode plot. In this instance, we don't usually talk about time delay, we talk about phase delay, or phase lag, for every frequency that makes up a signal. And what I've shown here is a process that has a higher phase delay for higher frequencies. We'll talk a bit more about phase delays shortly, but for now I want to compare this to non-distorting delays. Non-distorting time delays affect the entire signal equally, every frequency the same. Therefore the whole signal maintains the same shape and amplitude, but it's just postponed by some amount of time. And depending on the industry you're in and the specifics of the system you're talking about, you might refer to this as transport delay, or ideal delay, or unit delay, or latency. But regardless of the name, the impact is the same. An action occurs, and it takes some amount of time for the effects to take place. There is a time interval between the stimulation and the response. Both of these types of delay exist in real physical systems, and they both can cause problems in your controller design. This is because the controller has to use old information in order to determine the current controller output, or it has to predict into the future how its output will impact the system. This has the effect of lowering the sample time of your system, and therefore to counter it you have to lower the bandwidth or speed of your controller. If you don't lower the bandwidth, then the delay in the system could cause stability issues. You can see why by looking at the Bode plot of an arbitrary second order system. The crossover frequency is where the magnitude plot crosses the 0 dB line, and at that frequency you can see how much phase margin your system would have if you created a feedback loop around this second order system. In this case we have some positive phase margin, so our closed loop system would be stable. However, if we add more delay into our system, either with transport delay or by delaying frequencies around the crossover frequency, then the phase plot will move down in some way. This erodes our phase margin, and if we add too much delay, this could cause negative margin and an unstable system. Now to counter that, we could lower the bandwidth of the controller by moving the crossover point to a lower frequency. This would get our phase margin back, but in doing so, we limited the speed of our system. We slowed it down and made it less responsive. We can understand how this happens with a simple thought exercise. Imagine driving a car that has a five second delay between moving the steering wheel and having the car respond. If you're driving on a long straight road, this might not have too much of an impact. However, when a turn comes up, then you may find yourself starting to turn the wheel. And since nothing happens and the curve is still approaching, you panic and turn the wheel even more. By the time the car starts to respond, you've turned the wheel much too far, and even though you've brought the wheel back to a neutral position, the car continues to turn sharply off the road. 
To counter that, you start to turn the wheel desperately in the opposite direction, to bring the car back on the road. But again with the delay, you have the same problem, and you end up wildly swerving back and forth. Now, if delay in your system becomes a problem like this, then minimizing at its source is almost always preferred over slowing down your system or trying to figure out some clever way for your controller to handle it. In other words, why not reduce that five second delay rather than require that your driver stay only on straight roads or drive really slowly? Once you know the source of the delay, then you can trade the cost of trying to remove it versus just building around it. In order to know how to remove the delays, we need to understand where they come from in a typical system. And to do that, we'll talk about the main components in a feedback system, sensors, actuators, the controller, and the process itself. There are more delay sources than what I'm about to mention, but this will get you in the right mindset to think about the problem for your system. To begin, let's talk about unintentional delays. These are delays that are a byproduct of the design and not something that was included on purpose. All real dynamic systems introduce phase delay, or distort the signal by delaying some frequencies more than others. This is true whether it's a mechanical or electrical system. At some level, moving mass or energy around is dependent on the frequency of the input and the material it's moving through. Even the stiffest mechanical components act like a spring when you start talking about input signals that approach the speed of sound through that material. In addition, there are design components that might be added into the system for a necessary reason, but that increase phase delay as a byproduct. These are things like low-pass filters to remove noise, anti-aliasing filters prior to digitizing an analog signal, and building integrators into your controller. This means that all sensors, actuators, and processes have dynamics that create some amount of phase delay across the spectrum. And depending on your controller design, it can also add phase delay. Now, if this is the cause of your delay woes in your system, then it might be necessary to look into faster sensors and actuators that don't have as much lag, or sensors that have less noise, so that you don't have the phase lag penalty that comes along with low-pass filters. But again, phase delay isn't the whole story. We also have to consider transport delays. For example, imagine a control system that is trying to maintain a set temperature of an object by turning on and off a heater. Ideally, when the controller senses that the temperature is too low, it'll turn on the heater and then observe immediately that the temperature is rising. This, sadly, is not the case because even in this simple system, there's a number of sources of transport delays. Let's start between the actuator and the sensor. A time delay occurs when a sensor, like a temperature sensor, is isolated from the state that it's measuring. There's a thermal path between the heater and the object and the sensor. Therefore, it won't detect a change in temperature as soon as the heater turns on. The heat would take time to flow from the heater to the sensor. Now, a temp sensor is measuring the analog temperature but somewhere along the line it has to sample it periodically to create a discrete measurement that can be used by a digital computer. After a sample, the value is held constant until the next sample period. This means that just before a new measurement, the system is using a value that is almost one sample time old. If the sample rate of your sensor is too slow compared to the speed at which the measurement is changing, this may be a significant source of transport delay. Now that we have this raw digital measurement, software processing also takes time. In a lot of cases, the sample time of a digital system is determined based on how fast it can ingest measurements or other inputs, run all of the digital logic, including the control logic, and then calculate the outputs. In some cases, however, the computer may pause processing if it can't finish in one sample time and then continue during the next cycle. In this way, several sample periods may pass between receiving a measurement and processing that logic. Another source of delay is intentional delays. These are pauses that are designed into the system on purpose. One form of this is slack time, or a buffer that's added to the amount of time it is expected to take a process to complete. For example, you may calculate that your sensor processing algorithm will take 30 milliseconds to complete. Therefore, you may give the process 50 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds of slack time to account for the possible random variations in processing time. Adding this 20 milliseconds is probably preferred over occasionally having a process fail to complete within the deadline of a real-time system. 
Signals also take time to transmit between the sensors, the computers, and the actuators. This may be the relatively low delay of electrons moving across a wire, but it could also be the longer latencies of network delay if your systems have to communicate across multiple distributed computers. Another intentional delay comes from the desire to synchronize or align certain signals. This is helpful if you want your system to be deterministic or have predictable behavior. An example of this might be intentionally waiting until the next sample time for an actuator command to be executed, rather than executing it as soon as it's available. A command might not always be issued at the same time within a sample period due to fluctuations in processing time, so rather than executing a command on that unknown time boundary, it may be preferred to wait until the start of the following sample time so you always know exactly when that command executes. Now, even after the command is issued within the actuator, transport delays in the actuators mean that there's even more time before the system actually starts changing. In our case, the heat starts flowing. So all of these delays, transmission, synchronization, processing, energy and mass movements, sampling, slack time, and more, when they're all combined, they create dead time between when a command is issued and when the controller processes the measured response. That's the non-distorting transport delay part. For our car example, we were claiming this process from steering wheel command to you recognizing the car was turning was five seconds, and that may be too long to keep a fast driving car stable. Similarly, if the delay for this temperature controller is too long, if the dead time is too long, we may find that this system goes unstable as well. So how can we find that out? Well, let's say that you're able to fit your real temperature management system to a first order plus dead time model. That's the controller, actuators, process, and sensors. The dead time portion rolls up all of the non-distorting transport delays, and the first order LTI model captures the distorting phase delays. At this point, you can use that model to analyze the impact all these delays would have on your closed loop system. And since there is the potential of longer delays in the system due to unforeseen causes, when we designed closed loop systems, we maintain some amount of phase or time margin. This is extra delay, either at a specific frequency or for the whole signal that our system can absorb before it becomes unstable. For simple systems, we can use Bode plots to calculate phase margin and design a controller accordingly, like I sort of hinted at earlier in this video. However, Bode plots don't work for nonlinear system models or for linear system models with internal delay. Internal delay occurs with systems that have delay in an inner feedback loop. Let's look at this simple feedback system with delay in the forward path G of S. If you simplify the block diagram to create H of S of the whole feedback system, you can see that the delay term is present in both the numerator and the denominator, and you can't factor it out to just a single dead time delay. Now, if we wrap an outer loop around it, H of S is the open loop transfer function, and this delay makes it difficult to analyze with the traditional control theory tools. Now, in this particular case, we could replace the transport delay with a high order transfer function using a pad A approximation technique. In this way, our system would become a normal LTI transfer function, and classical analysis techniques would work to find the phase margin or time margin for the system. But I want to show you a way to estimate time margin for systems that are highly nonlinear. Or another way of putting it, systems that can't be approximated well by a linear model even if you replace the delay terms with pad A approximants. For these systems, we can rely on a model. I've duplicated that system in Simulink where you can see that there is a 100 millisecond delay in the inner loop. This particular system has a nice rise time and good steady state characteristics. And since we can simulate this system, a simple way to measure the delay margin is to just add a delay block into the model and just keep increasing the value until the system doesn't have the performance you need. Whatever delay you added is the margin in the system. A 100 millisecond delay changes the response a little bit, but it's performance that I can live with. Same with 300 milliseconds delay. 
However, at 400 milliseconds of delay, the behavior is worse than I would want. So I would say that this system has 300 milliseconds performance margin. However, if I keep increasing the margin, I can find that right around 700 milliseconds or so, the system becomes unstable. So I have maybe 650 milliseconds or around there of stability margin. Now, if you don't have as much delay margin in your design as you would like, then you either design a slower controller or start the process of investigating where this delay is coming from and attempting to remove it at the source. If you're not familiar with analyzing and designing time delay systems, MathWorks has a webinar that I've linked to in the description below. And if you don't want to miss the next Tech Talk video, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Also, if you want to check out my channel, Control System Lectures, I cover more control theory topics there as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.